Okay, so let's talk a little bit more specifically about the cell membrane. So the cell membrane, as many of you guys remember, maintains homeostasis. Um, and it does that by being selectively permeable. Do you all remember what selectively permeable means? It means that it only lets certain things go in and out. So by maintaining homeostasis, it's able to do that by controlling what goes in and out of the cell. Okay, if you look at your structure of your cell membrane, you've got your phospholipid bilayer and the various proteins that are throughout this phospholipid bilayer. By having this particular structure, it can regulate what goes in and out. Only certain things are able to get through the phospholipid bilayer. Uh, the proteins only allow certain things through their channel. Okay, and so it's going to help maintain the cell's internal environment by controlling that. Okay, it's going to be different than the cell wall in that sense. Okay, the cell wall, its job is to prevent bursting. Okay, and so the cell wall is trying to present, prevent the cell from bursting or exploding. Okay, and that cell wall is really permeable. It allows virtually everything to go into the cell. So your cell membrane is made up mostly of phospholipids. And hopefully we remember a little bit from organic compounds of what our phospholipids are like. So phospholipids have two basic parts. Okay? They have a hydrophilic portion. Okay? Remember, hydrophilic is water-loving, okay? so it likes water. Okay? So there is the hydrophilic phospho phosphate head. Okay? So here's the charged phosphate head. So these portions are hydrophilic. They like water because, remember, water has a charge. Water is made up of those polar covalent bonds, and because the the bonds that hold the oxygen and the hydrogen together are polar covalent. That makes that hydrogen have a little positive charge and the oxygen have a little negative charge. So the phosphate head, which has this charge here, you see this negative charge on it, the phosphate head is hydrophilic, okay? It is attracted to the water. There is also the hydrophobic portions of the phospholipid. And so the hydrophobic portions would be these hydrocarbon tails. Okay, the hydrocarbon tails here are made up of mostly um, carbon and hydrogen bonds, and so those are not going to have a charge. So those are hydrophobic. They are water-fearing. They don't like water. And if you all remember, that makes our molecule what is called amphipathic. Okay, and amphipathic molecules have both hydrophilic and hydrophobic portions. So these phospholipids can move throughout the bilayer, and they can move laterally. Okay, so they can move side to side along the bilayer. Very rarely will they actually flip from one side of the bilayer to the other. Okay, but they can move relatively freely from side to side, laterally. And so in membranes that contain more of these unsaturated uh, phospholipids, okay, so remember um, the phospholipid has the phosphate head, Okay, and the fatty acid tail. And remember, saturated versus unsaturated fats. Okay, unsaturated fats will have some double bonds in them, and those double bonds cause the tails to kink okay, or bend at that double bond. And so when that double bond occurs and the tail bends, that, uh, that, involves, that allows for more spacing between the phospholipids. So these membranes are more fluid when they have more unsaturated hydrocarbons in them. Membranes that have more saturated hydrocarbon tails, they are more viscous, or they're more um, almost solid-like. They are not very, um, they're more rigid, for lack of a better term. These phospholipids do not move as easily. It's not as fluid because they're packed in nice and tight together because they are fully saturated. Remember, all of those carbons are bonded to all of the hydrogens they could possibly be bonded to. And so that keeps their fatty acid tails nice and straight so they can pack in there nice and tight. Remember, your saturated fats are the ones that are solid at room temperature because they can pack in together like that, where your unsaturated fats are usually liquid at room temperature. Um, applying to organisms, okay, a lot of your organisms that need to prepare for winter will start adding more of these unsaturated phospholipids to their cell membranes as winter comes so that when it gets so cold, their cell membranes do not solidify. They have more of the space and they're more fluid. So cholesterol is found in the cell membranes of animals. Okay, so cholesterol is not in plant cell membranes. Okay, it is only in animal cell membranes. That's important that we remember that. 
And cholesterol has an impact, a big impact on the fluidity of the membrane. Okay? The cholesterol can make the membrane a little bit less permeable. It can make it harder for molecules to get across. You can see the cholesterol here can form a loose bond with those hydrocarbon tails, okay, with those hydrocarbon tails that are coming off of the phospholipid. The cholesterol can form a loose bond with those, so it's harder for molecules to get across the cell membrane. Um, cholesterol can also um, help increase or decrease the fluidity of the membrane. So cholesterol can help increase fluid fluidity in membranes that have a lot of saturated lipids. Remember in your saturated membranes, those phospholipids are packed in nice and tight. So when we wedge a cholesterol molecule in there between them, it opens up some space. Okay? And so that would increase the fluidity of the cell membrane when there's lots of saturated lipids. In phospholipid membranes that consist of a lot of unsaturated lipids, it can actually decrease the fluidity. Okay? And so it can decrease the fluidity by giving those unsaturated phospholipids, okay, it'll help actually fill in these gaps so there's not big gaps there from those bent tails. Okay? And so it will help fill in the gaps in the spaces and it will also give the unsaturated lipids somewhere to help anchor in. So in an unsaturated membrane, cholesterol will decrease the fluidity. In a saturated membrane, it will help increase the fluidity. In addition to the phospholipids, there are also proteins that are embedded in the, throughout the phospholipids. The proteins, those are what really set the cell membranes apart. Okay? The proteins are what make them different. And I mean different like from a plant to an animal cell, um, different from a prokaryotic cell to, a, um, to an animal cell or to a plant cell, because those phospholipids are all the same. Just like in DNA, remember if y'all remember you have that sugar phosphate backbone, that's the same in every single organism. The nitrogen bases are actually the same, it's just the order that's different. So in this case, the phospholipids are the same in all of these organisms, and it's the membranes and the membrane placement that's different. And we have two basic kinds of membranes. We have intrinsic or integral membranes, okay? And so these are ones that are going to be embedded in the membrane. So these intrinsic membranes are embedded in the membrane. They usually span the entire width of the membrane. And your extrinsic are also called peripheral membranes. And so these will stay on the edges, okay? And so these will be on the surface of the membrane. So we've got a variety of different kinds of proteins. Okay, so the first one we're talking about here is our transport proteins. So transport proteins do just that. Okay, they transport things across the phospholipid bilayer. Remember, the bilayer is not permeable to everything. Okay, um, for example, uh, let's talk about what's called an aquaporin. Okay, so an aquaporin is uh, this right here. This would be an example of an aquaporin. If you think about water as polar, Okay, and so as water has a charge, so as water molecules try to come through the cell membrane, they're attracted to the phospholipid head because it has a charge. And so it, they're okay with that. But you, then you've got this big giant region in the middle here okay, that is hydrophobic. And so it does not like the water. It actually kicks the water back out. It, it's what really forms the barrier. Because remember in our biological organisms, we've got water as our medium essentially on the inside and both the outside. And so we create the barrier by having this hydrophobic region of the phospholipid bilayer. But water's got to be able to get in and out of the cell. Okay? And so water can move easily in and out of the cell through these channels here called aquaporins. Okay? And so that's what a transport protein is going to do. It's going to allow things to get back and forth across the membrane. Uh, what you have over here, okay? so you've got what looks like your sodium potassium pump here, moving things back and forth across the membrane. These uh, transport proteins are also sometimes called permeases. That's a P. Let's try again. So again, these are also sometimes called permeases, meaning that they allow things to permeate. Okay, they're proteins. In, uh, remember, a lot of our protein enzymes are proteins. So these permeases are transport proteins. Then also we've got some of our proteins that are just going to be enzymes. They'll have an active site on them, and they'll be able to help speed up that chemical reaction. We've got a large amount of proteins that will act as receptors okay, for cell communication. So they say here signal transduction. 
Okay, but these are basically just receptor proteins. And we'll talk more about signal transduction pathways when we talk about cell communication. But basically, we've got a receptor, similar to an enzyme in that it will be uh, specific, usually shape-specific for a particular um, substrate. Uh, let's say uh, maybe insulin. Okay, and so we have an insulin receptor, and when that insulin is present and binds to the receptor, on the protein, that would then start the pathway, the chemical pathway, that would trigger the uptake of glucose from the blood. Okay, so they can be receptor sites as well. Okay, and we've got three more types of membrane proteins that we could see. Okay, so we've got ones that act as ID, or cell-to-cell -cell recognition. You remember those glycoproteins? Okay, they'll have a carbohydrate attached to them. Okay, and so those glycoproteins with their carbohydrate attachments, they are going to help provide recognition, almost like a name tag for the cell. Okay, we've got proteins that will help the cells join together. Okay, if, if we can get the other video uploaded, you will, um, it'll, it talks about animal cell junctions like desmosomes and gap junctions and tight junctions. And so that's what these kind of proteins would be. Sometimes our cells, especially in a multicellular organism, need to be held together. Okay, and then you also have proteins that will hold the cell to the cytoskeleton. Okay, so they'll bind it on the inside here to the cytoskeleton, to the microtubules, microfilaments, intermediate fibers there. Um, and then in an animal cell only, bind it to those fibers that are in the extracellular matrix. Remember we had the fibronectin and the collagen in that extracellular matrix. And so animal cells may have some of these proteins that will help attach to that. Remember, plant cells are not going to have that extracellular matrix. So the cell membrane is arranged in what's called the fluid mosaic model. Okay? Fluid in the sense that, remember, those uh, phospholipids were able to move back and forth across the laterally throughout the cell membrane. So they're not static. They're not stuck in one particular place. Okay? So the cell membrane is fluid. The mosaic pattern is that these proteins can be inserted um, throughout, you know, like a tile mosaic. So these proteins are inserted throughout the cell membrane at various locations. And again, remember, the proteins are what really make these different, make these cell membranes different from organism to organism. And as you look at the proteins, you will see that they are also arranged. Okay? They have hydrophobic and hydrophilic portions of them as well. Okay? The hydrophobic portions are there in the middle with the hydrophobic portions of the phospholipid, and the hydrophilic regions are on the edges okay, where they would be coming in contact with that water medium. Okay? And so that's how they, that helps determine their arrangement in that phospholipid bilayer. These are never going to be turned, you know, this protein here, okay, so this large protein here is never going to be turned 90 degrees like this on its side Okay, so because then you would have a hydrophilic region here in the middle of your hydrophobic portion of your phospholipid bilayer. So by the protein having those two regions, that also helps determine how it's going to fit into that bilayer. So our cell membrane will change size. Okay, it can increase and decrease in size due to its interaction with the vesicles. Okay, in particular, if we talk about endocytosis versus exocytosis, if you all remember what those are, Okay, so exocytosis, remember that's when we're spitting things out of the cell. Okay, so what we have here is exocytosis happening over here. Okay, and so this exocytosis, the vesicle, so the, remember we've got our endomembranous system here, and so it came from the protein, came from the, in, the endoplasmic reticulum to the Golgi apparatus, to the cis phase of the Golgi apparatus coming out the trans phase after being modified, and then the cell is going to spit it out. And when the cell spits that out, that actually is going to increase the size of the cell membrane because that vesicle joins with the cell membrane. So it just added some space there to the cell membrane. When we do endocytosis and we take things into the cell, remember endocytosis is basically the opposite of exocytosis. So if I'm doing endocytosis here, I make this invagination here, and I'm going to pinch it off and make a vesicle. Okay? So that's actually going to make my cell membrane smaller. Okay? It's going to bring that in and make it smaller. So just a little recap here of all of our different parts of the cell membrane. Let's see if I can find a color you'll really be able to see. Yeah, we'll see how this works. Okay, so all of our different parts of the cell membrane. And I've got my, so just a reminder here, I've got my phospholipid bilayer here. 
There's my cholesterol embedded in it, which affects, remember, it affects the fluidity of the cell membrane. Here's my proteins. Okay, I've got some of those anchoring proteins. I've got a mix of peripheral or extrinsic proteins versus integral or intrinsic proteins. I've got some of these glycolipids that are going to help um, identify the cell and name the cell. Okay, um, can you guys tell which kind of cell membrane this is? Hopefully you realize it's an animal cell membrane, in particular because it has this extracellular matrix surrounding it, and that's an animal cell only. Okay. So again, we've got this wide variety of proteins in there, and this constantly changing and shifting phospholipid bilayer, which will help control what goes in and out of our cells.